Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, on your way out today, we have some things on the table that might be beneficial to help you. We don't uh, believe in just carrying stuff that is just doesn't have any purpose. We have purpose in what we carry. Uh, I'm going to share with you my story of how I got made free or got set free many years ago. And I've actually written a book about it. It's called The Journey to Freedom. And the book is only 100 pages long so that men can actually read it. <laughs> Come on, guys. How many times have you picked up a book that's really thick? You read about this far through and you went, this is never going to happen. So you got rid of it, right? So uh, grab that book. Now, some of you might say, well, I don't really read at all. I just, I'm not a reader. Well, I have good news for you. We have it as an audio book as well. So you can just put that in your car and just put it as your, uh, or your truck as you're driving. Um, how many of you enjoyed the, the worship music today? Um, we have a, uh, a newer worship CD. It's called New Generation Ministry Worship. There is a song on here. How many of you have ever been really, really fed up with the enemy? Just so fed up with what he's been doing in your life or your family's life or in the city or the country? Uh, there's a song in here called Our God Reigns Here. If this song doesn't get you singing and shouting and like... I've gone down the road with tears running down my face, just singing that at the top of my lungs. It is such a powerful song. So I encourage you, grab this CD, the one with the purple on the front. That's a good, good song. Uh, at the very start of that, there's a bunch of good songs on that CD. Um, our son, Garrett, and Caitlin, our daughter, they made a CD. This is every bit as good as any Jesus Culture or Bethel Worship CD. I don't know if some of you are into those, that music. Uh, you can grab one of those. Um, Kathy has a message... Uh, to women that helps uh, them to deal with um, people who struggle with freedom as well. And uh, I've got a message on forgiveness. I shared that about four years or five years ago here. It's a great message. Uh, when I was a kid, I was abused and how I went through the process of forgiveness and how you can find great freedom through forgiveness. And then we have some, um, the message I share today is available on CD or DVD. And we have some piano music about 45 minutes of piano music for those of you who like to have devotional times and you just want to have some quiet music playing while you're listening to that. Now, on our table, we have some magnets. And if you'd like to pray for us, we would appreciate you grabbing one of these and putting it in your, on your fridge just to remind you to pray for our family. We have found, um, uh, we've been on, our, on the road for 30, this is, this, I'm just starting my 33rd year on the road. I know you guys think, how can that guy be so young and be on the road for so many years, right? But I'm using oil of delay. <laughs> but um, we've got, we've got uh, many, many people who pray for us. We don't have that many people who support us on a monthly basis, and I'm not against that if you'd like to. But I found if I have people who pray for me on a regular basis, God seems to bring in finances. So if you would just pick up a card and say, I'll pray for these guys. I can't necessarily give to them, but I'll pray for them. That'd be great. We also have an email uh, newsletter list that you can just go to our website, grab one of these cards, go to the website and just click on newsletters and then sign up for the newsletter. And that you'll get a four times a year, you'll get a, a newsletter that tells you where we've gone, where we're going. Um, if you had been on our newsletter uh, list, you would have known that in September, I did something crazy. How many of you guys have ever done anything really crazy? Yeah? What's the craziest thing that you've ever done? You know, I went, I flew to Chicago in September, and I got on my bicycle, and I pedaled down Route 66 from Chicago to Santa Monica. You know how many miles that is? 2,500 miles. 32 days. So, you know, I, you thought I didn't look that stupid, but I am stupid. <laughs> it was crazy. One day I did 132 miles. So, but that's why, uh, that's why, you know, we need prayer. I was on my bicycle one morning. I was in Joplin, Missouri, going across the bridge about 5.30 in the morning. And I, you know how on the, on the road bikes you have the handlebars that come around like that? You've all seen them, right? I had a little mirror on my bike that stuck out about this far. I had a pickup truck come by and take the mirror right off my bicycle. That's how close I was to being not here today. So, so prayer for our family, prayer for me when I do stupid things. Or, but it was, it was a missions trip. We, did, we went, across, uh, went across the country. Our, our heart was to put the, the gospel 
back into the heart of America. Route 66 goes straight through the heart of America. So we took the 66 books of the Bible and just with a bunch of six guys and we biked across America and we were just sharing the gospel. I remember one morning, you ever had it, Pastor, you, you, you go to, um, you're doing something and something breaks and you get frustrated? Well, I was using my phone as a GPS and in order to keep the phone charged all day, you know that you have to have enough electricity or battery. And my, uh, so I had a battery pack that would give my phone the charge. Well, the cord between the battery pack and the, the phone went broke. And so I was frustrated. I wanted to make a lot of miles, you know, and I wanted to get to where I was going. And so as uh, luck or providence would have it, I ended up seeing a Walmart. And I thought, okay, I'll go in there, get a cord, and I'll keep going. So I go to buy a cord. Well, the cords, just one cord is five bucks. Now, I'm pretty careful with my money. I don't want to spend five bucks on a cord. And so I thought I could go to the dollar store, and I think I'm going to waste more time. So I went. Then I saw they had a battery pack and a cord for $8. Well, then it became a good deal. So I bought that. But it had one of those blister packs. You ever seen those blister packs? You cannot open them unless you have a scissors. And so I'm like, oh, now i got to go. And so I saw a beauty salon in the... Um, in the Walmart, so I thought, all right, they got to have scissors at a beauty salon, right? So I went over to the beauty salon, and there's two girls sitting there at the counter or at the register, and I said, hey, could you guys please open this um, pack for me? So they went and opened the thing, and of course, I'm dressed in spandex, right? You know, the bike shorts and everything like that, and they're like, what are you doing? And I got a Mission 66 thing, so I thought, all right, okay, I got to, I'm, I'm supposed to be preaching, so I might as well tell these people about Jesus, but I want to get going here. And so I said, yeah, I'm on a mission. We're going across uh, America on Route 66. And uh, they said, oh, what's that about? And so I said, well, we got some videos. We posted them on Facebook every day. So I said, would you like to watch one of the videos? So they're like, okay. So I'm like, oh, it's going to take more time. But anyway, so they start watching this video. And K.R. Malie, the pastor from Pennsylvania who organized the trip, he says, hey, glad you're watching the video today. And if you, uh, we've just been seeing a lot of people come to Jesus. And if you used to know Jesus or you used to follow Jesus or you don't know Jesus, it would, today would be a great day for you to come and begin to follow him or return to following him. And both these girls started crying. And they're like probably 25 to 30, somewhere in there. And I'm looking at the video and I'm looking at them crying. I'm going, okay, what is going on here? So I paused the phone. I said, are you guys all right? And these two girls, they said to me, well, we were just talking this morning Three years ago, both of us walked away from Jesus. And to this morning, we were saying, isn't it about time we started going back to church and getting back with Jesus again? <laughs> and so I said, would you like to do that right now? And they said, how do we do that? Well, as an evangelist, I got a little bit of experience. So I prayed with them, and they both were crying. And I was like, okay, Jesus, now I know I had a broken cord. You know, I'm a little bit thick upstairs. If you guys are been a little bit thick upstairs, you know. And so, you know, when you have um, something come into your life, that slows you down or puts you off, you know, your course, your plan, I just want to encourage you, maybe open your eyes a little bit wider and see what God might not have for you to do that day. Amen? That was for free. I wasn't planning on sharing that. but So, again, grab a magnet and pray for us. We also have a gas can on our table. If after the offering you'd still like to help us with fuel, you can put um, money in the gas can. And the last thing is, if you're here today, you might be a visitor or you might uh, know some other people in ministry. If you like the message or you feel like what we do has value and you feel like, I'd like this to be in some other churches, I would like you to take a card or give me the contact information of other places that you believe might want to have us. I'm always looking for other places to minister. A lot of churches, they don't know what we do and they don't know of the credibility that we have. But if you were to say, hey, I've heard this guy and he's good, and his family's good, that would maybe help us get into some different places, all right? Let's pray, and then let's go to the Word. Father, we just thank you for this place and this opportunity to speak here today. Pray that you'd speak through me by your Holy Spirit. Open the hearts and the ears of those who listen, and open my mind to receive whatever you want to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I get a volunteer? I need a guy who's strong, all right? So either I'm going to, can someone volunteer who's strong? Or does one of you ladies want to volunteer your husband or your son or something like that? 
I just need, okay, come on. What's your first name? You want to stand right up there? What's your first name? Evan. Evan? Hey, great. Just stand right up on there. Yeah, yeah, that's good. There you go. All right. So, Evan, I want you to, uh, to help me, all right? I'm just going to sit down. You're going to preach the rest of the sermon, okay? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. That would be putting them on the spot, wouldn't it? All right. So, Evan, I want you just to hold this chain up like that, just straight up, all right? With, on your thumb there, yeah, just hold it tight, yeah. Okay, so, so and you've got to just keep it up straight because it's going to get heavy because I know you're strong, but it's going to get heavy. So I want to teach you a little bit of theology just for a moment. <laughs> you getting tired already? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, don't get too tired. So the Bible says God holds the rules. There's 10 rules that we know of called the 10 commandments, commandments right? What are some of them real quick? Don't tell a lie. Don't steal. The government doesn't like competition, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, that's pretty similar to that, yeah. Um, you know, don't covet. Don't commit adultery, right? You know the rules, right? Now, I believe that when we are born, all right, we are born innocent of personal transgression against a holy God, okay? So we're born personally innocent, okay? Some of you are going, what about total depravity? What about, you know, let's not go all that stuff. Just slow down. Innocent of personal transgression. So when we're born, we are connected to God. Now, Evan is a picture of God. God is strong. He is almighty. He's powerful, right? Are you powerful? On a good day. Yeah, on a good day. <laughs> so, so we could be connected to God by the law because we never broke it, all right? So each one of us knows we shouldn't steal. But there comes a day when mom says, now those cookies are for company. Don't you be touching them. But we decide we need those cookies more than the company needs them. And we take them and they end up inside us somehow. We don't even know how it happened. And then we have become a transgressor, a thief, a st whatever you want to call it, right? How many of these links did I have to break to become disconnected from God? The Bible says if we've broken one of the laws, we've broken the whole law. So we fall down dead in sin and trespasses, okay? Every one of us in this room at one point in time was completely separated from God because of our transgression or our sin. Are you with me? No. Come on. You getting tired? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Come on down. Come on down. Come so, on down. Yeah, yeah. Now, just a second. I, I was expecting someone strong up here, but I guess... Well, it's you, not a good day. Yeah. <laughs> now, Evan, the Bible says when we sin, we become subject to sin. So I want you to take that chain. I want you to put it around my neck. Around your neck. Yeah. And now I want you to stay with me for a second. Now, the Bible says there's three things that cause us to sin. Our flesh, the world around us, and the devil, right? So I want you, Evan, now to be my flesh, the world, and the devil. And I want you to drag me around the platform while I try to preach, all right? Where are we going? You go wherever you want. I'm going where I want to go. See? <laughs> So I want to do what God wants me to do, but sin and my flesh and the world and the devil is pulling me. Thanks. Great job, man. Give me a hand. Give me a hand, guys. Have you ever been in that position where you felt a pull on you that, you know, I don't want to be doing this anymore. I've done that before and I, it's not good, but it pulls you. You know, that is, that's the law of sin. Now, before you know Jesus, that is locked up. You can't get free from that. You can sin a lot or you can sin a little, but you're always stuck on this chain. It's called bondage to sin, the law of sin and death, right? Now, would you like to know how to get this chain unlocked and off your neck? Buy my book. Let's pray. Let's go home. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Okay, well, let's, let's think about this room. Like, right now I'm wearing this chain. This chain is kind of like symbolic of addiction. How many of you have ever struggled with an addiction, a habit, a hang-up, or something in your life where you just wish you could quit? Right? Okay, some of you are honest. The rest of you are still lying. That's a bondage too, you know? All right. So, but, you know, most of us have our addictions or our sins. We're just kind of like, 
Hey, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Are you good? Oh, I'm good, right? How many people have ever, you know, shaken your hand, say, how you doing? I'm good, right? We sometimes lie about these things. And what I want to talk to you today about is when I was about nine years old, I was molested. And as a result of that, I picked up all kinds of lies in my life about myself. You know, when you're abused, you begin to believe lies about yourself. And those lies begin to influence your life and cause you to do things that are not helpful in your life. Some people medicate. You know, you see people, how many of you have ever seen a person who struggles with alcohol or drugs, right? If you were to ever go into their past and ask them, what happened to you? You might find some very, very tough things. And they're not sitting there, they didn't go out one day and say, you know what, I want to go become an alcoholic. I want to become a drug addict. There was pain, and they tried to dull in the pain. They tried to comfort themselves. They tried to help themselves. So anyone in this room who struggles, I'm not here to beat you up in any way. I'm here to encourage you to let you know that there is an answer. You know, when I got to be about uh, 16 years old, I was so addicted. I had such an a impure thought life, and, and I... Uh, I went to this rally, and this guy said, you know, if you're headed the wrong direction in life, and you got a great big bunch of sin on your back, and you want to be forgiven, you need to turn away from the way you're going, and turn, the Christian word for that is repent, and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And when I was 16 years old, I turned away from my sin, I put my faith and my trust in Jesus, and I had this great big backpack of sin fall off my back, and I felt forgiven. And I was so incredibly happy. I was running across this football field at this stadium, and I was just saying, wow, I feel so forgiven. And how many of you have ever had that feeling in your life? And for about two years, I did incredibly well. When I got to be about 18 years old, I began to get stuck and tangled up in the garbage again. And I thought, here I am, a single guy. If I just get married, all my troubles will be over. And all the married men said, I did not hear a very loud amen. Pastor, did I miss something there? You know, getting married does not solve your problems. Don't say that amen too loud. But it actually can complicate your life even more because you're going to marry... See, you have your issues and then you're going to marry someone who probably has some issues and that combination can sometimes be quite toxic. I remember uh, getting married when I was 21, and my wife was so good to me in every way, believe me. But she couldn't fix what was broken inside this brain of mine. And I, I struggled with this, this addiction, and I struggled, and I struggled. And I remember trying all kinds of things to get free, and I finally read this one book that helped me understand where freedom comes from. Can you give me the first slide? Many years ago in the United States, there was a a man who was born on a plantation. He was black. And at that time, in 1860, all the black people were slaves simply because of their color. You know the history of the United States, right? Abraham Lincoln came along, and he declared a new law, and he said all the black people are to go free. He called that what? The Emancipation Proclamation. So this slave went to his master, and he said, am I now a free man? His master said, no, that doesn't apply to you. You keep working. That was a lie, all right? Then that slave, he continued working as a slave for four more years till one day he looked around. He saw all the other plantations were empty. And he recognized my old master is a liar. And with that, he walked away from the plantation. Four years too late. Now, when I read that story, I was so frustrated, I thought, why didn't that slave just act on the truth as soon as he heard it, leave the plantation, he could have been free. And then it was like God said to me, Lloyd, you are exactly like that slave. The moment you received Jesus, you were set free from your sin. Now, some of you are going, I thought you just got forgiven when you got saved. Well, that's true, but you don't just get forgiven. You get set free at the same time. And so I began to ponder this story, and it took me to the scriptures in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 19. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there with me, all right? I'm going to be living to you from the uh, Living Translation, or the, the, new, um, 
the Living Bible, pardon me. Uh, so let's go to the Scriptures. You want to stand with me as we read the Scripture? Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 19. Can you give me the next slide? Well, then, shall we keep sinning so God can keep showing us more and more kindness and forgiveness? Of course not. Should we keep sinning when we don't have to? For sin's power over us was broken when we became Christians and were baptized to become part of Jesus Christ. Through his death, the power of your sinful nature was shattered. Next slide. Your old sin-loving nature was buried with him by baptism when he died. And when God the Father with glorious power was brought him back to life again, you were given his wonderful new life to enjoy. Let's read verse 5 together. For you have become a part of him. And so you died with him, so to speak, when he died, and now you share his new life and shall rise as he did. Now, I want all of you to put your hands up like this. All right, now give me all your money. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Okay, so this is God, right? And this is you. Now, the Bible says you are in him and he is in you. So I want you to take your hands and put them in each other. So which hand is in which hand? Both hands are in each other, aren't they, right? So you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. So now, move your hands back and forth. So whatever Christ did, you did. Are you with me? Well, why does that matter? Well, let's go to the next verse, verse 6. It says, Your old evil desires were nailed to the cross with him. That part of your body that loves to sin was crushed and fatally wounded. So your sin-loving body is no longer under sin's control, no longer needs to be, a slave to sin. In other words, the the chain or the law of sin, the moment you receive Jesus Christ, Jesus takes the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He puts them in the lock that chains you to sin. And the moment you believe, you become free from the bondage of sin. So now, if you look at me right now, How many of you would say, Lloyd is now free? Put your hands up. All right, how many would say, Lloyd is still bound? All right, how many would say, I wouldn't vote no matter what you did? (laughs) That's another sermon, all right? Okay, let me ask you this question. Is the chain unlocked? So am I legally free, but I'm not experientially free? See, I believe this position here, if you could get a picture of this in your mind, if you want to take a picture of this and put it on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, but this position right here is where most Christians live their lives. They understand intellectually that they are free from sin, but they don't experience freedom. I believe there's so many Christians that live in that place, and that's why I want to tell this story everywhere in the world, because I believe that there's truth in God's word that can make us free. So let's go through the truth. When you're dead to sin, you're freed from all its allure and power over you. Verse 8. And since your old sin-loving nature died with Christ, we now know that you will share his new life. Christ rose from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. He died once for all to end sin's power, but now lives forever in unbroken fellowship with God. Let's read the next verse together. So look upon your old sin nature as dead and unresponsive to sin, and instead be alive to God, alert to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if you went to the King James Version of the Bible, how many of you have ever heard of the King James Version? All right, it's an older version, but it says, reckon yourself. Now, when you get to Canada, you ask people what... Reckon, they don't even know what the word means. But you get down south, they're like, what do you reckon, right? What do you reckon? What do you think? right? The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you think like a slave, you'll act like a slave. You know, if all of us were to get in my bus and we were to go and get, up, get down to a plantation somewhere and start picking cotton, right? Acting like slaves, looking like slaves, eating slave food, drinking slave water, living in slave houses, wearing slave clothes, and working for 20 hours a day, having someone with a whip over us every day, they would think that we looked like slaves. We're acting like slaves. In fact, they would think that we were slaves. But if we were to go and say, okay, what? can I see your identification? And I would look at your identification. Evan, I'd say, hey, you are a free citizen of the United States. They'd look at my identification. They'd say, Lloyd, you are a free citizen of Canada. Why are you working on this plantation, right? But is it possible 
that each one of us could actually be free but acting like slaves in the natural? Is it possible that we're actually free spiritually from sin but still partaking in sin because we don't believe the truth? See, if anyone in this room is bound anywhere, it's probably because you believe a lie somewhere. Because the Bible says you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So if the truth will make you free, what will keep you bound? A lie. All right, let's continue. Don't let sin control your puny body any longer. Don't give in to its sinful desires. Don't let any part of your body become tools of wickedness to be used for sinning. But give yourselves completely to God Every part of you, for you're back from death, you want to be tools in the hands of God to be used for his good purposes. Sin need never again be your master, for now you're no longer tied to the law where sin enslaves you, but you're free under God's favor and mercy. Now, does this mean we can go ahead and sin and not worry about it? For our salvation does not depend on keeping the law, but on receiving God's grace? Of course not. Don't you realize you can choose your own master? You can choose sin with death or else obedience with acquittal? The one to whom you offer yourself, he will take you and be your master, and you will be his slave. Thank God, next slide, that though you once were slaves to sin, now you've obeyed with all your heart the teaching to which God has committed you, and now you are free from your old master sin, and you have become slaves to your new master righteousness. I speak this way using the illustration of slaves and masters because it's easy to understand. Just as you used to be slaves to all kinds of sin, now you must be slaves to to all that is right and holy. You can be seated. Now, if you want to remember my story, I recommend that you take some notes today, all right? So you can write on your bulletin. You can write on your phone. You can write on whatever you want, but take some notes today. These notes are worth about $100,000. Now, some of you are going, wow, this is the most expensive sermon that I've ever heard. And uh, the reason I say that is because if you're bound and you get married, and you don't get free, there's a good chance you won't stay married very long. And once you've been married for a while, and you get divorced, it can cost you some money. I know a couple right now, Pastor, they just got divorced. Their split was a million dollars between the two of them, and they both, so the guy thought he was pretty rich, but he became half as rich as he was. Actually, he lost about 60% of his money because his wife got a bit more than he did. But the reality is, if you don't get free, you're going to have issues. And they're going to affect you, male or female. The guy that just got divorced, he struggled with anger. Never, ever dealt with anger. And the reason I think he was angry was because of the abuse that happened to him when he was younger, but he never was able to deal with that issue. You know, some people think, I'll just get through it. You don't get through it. You have to work your way through those things. And sometimes it's tough uh, dealing with the abuse in your past. It's embarrassing. It's hurtful. But it can be worked out. So if you want to know how to remember my story, write down the word free. F-R-E-E. -E. First thing, next slide. I had to do in order to get free is I had to have faith in God's word. I had to believe what God said about me. John 8, verse 32, it says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, how many of you know people who know truth, and yet they're not free? Tons of people. In America, we know truth, but we're bound. So why is that? Well, let's go to the next slide. The Bible was written... In Hebrew and Greek, the New Testament was written in Greek. In Greek, there's two words for knowing. One's gnosis and one is epinosis. <laughs> the one word gnosis means intellectual knowledge or knowing. And the other one, epinosis, is experiential knowledge or experientially knowing. And you're going, man, I'm lost. What is the difference? Well, let me illustrate this way. My wife and I have six children. I have a gnosis of childbirth. We go to the hospital. My wife makes a bunch of racket. We have a child. I've done it six times. It does not hurt a bit. <laughs> How many of you men have children? Put your hands up. Does it hurt to have children, men? Doesn't hurt us a bit, right? 
See, we have a gnosis. We understand the process. I mean, apparently, the biological process of having a child, you know, apparently there's some pain involved. I think they exaggerate a little bit. What do you think? There you go. Absolutely. There you go. So, okay. So, so now, women, they have an epignosis. That's why they need an epidural. <laughs> How many of you women have had children? Does it hurt? See, you know differently than I know. See, I know, but you know, right? Apparently there's, now, if you wanted to know about childbirth, would it be better to ask a man or a woman? But don't we both know? See, we both know, but you know different, right? I believe that most Christians know truth like men know childbirth. See, we know it, but we don't really know it. Would you like to really know truth today? I want to do a little exercise with you that I think might begin to help you to understand how to know truth. I want you to imagine the thing that you always do that you wish you could stop doing. It may be a habit. It may be a stronghold in your life. It may be an addiction. It may be something that you've been bound with. It could be hatred, bitterness, prejudice, alcohol, drugs, overspending, overeating, fear. I have no idea what you're bound with. But I want you to think about that thing you, you wish to God that you could stop doing that, that you would never do that again. You may have been convicted of it many, many times, and you just, oh, man, I just, I cannot believe I did that again. I'm just so, you feel defeated when it happens. It just drives you crazy. And you know, as a believer, you shouldn't be like that, right? I want you to imagine, now some of you are going, whoa, this is pretty heavy, Right? I want you just to take a moment and look to your left and to your right. Look at those people sitting near you. Those people are just as messed up as you are, so don't worry. <laughs> you didn't think this church was that messed up, did you? People, people, think about that thing. Imagine that last night you did that thing again. You completely lost it, whatever you did. And you get up this morning and you feel so defeated. You feel so, you just didn't even want to come to church. In fact, you could hear a voice whisper in your ear, you're still my slave. You're never going to be free. You're such a failure. You're such a hypocrite. You know who that is? That's the enemy. The reality is you are actually free from that sin, but you didn't act like you were because you still believe a lie. So I'm going to be that voice that you might have heard, and I'm going to lie to you, and I want you to speak the truth to me out loud, all right? So I'm going to tell you the lie. You're going to tell me the truth. What is the truth? I am free. All right? So when you hear a lie, even if it's whispered to your subconscious, you need to speak out loud the truth because your words carry weight. All right? So here goes. You failed. I'm going to tell you the lie. You tell me the truth. You're still my slave. You're never going to be free. It only works for people who are in ministry. You have a predisposition to be like this. It's only natural. Okay, now, you people in South Carolina are so kind. 
and nice. But apparently, <laughs> but apparently, when you watch sporting events and the people with those black and white shirts make decisions that you disagree with, you lift up your voice in consternation and upset because you feel like they told a lie. And when they tell that lie, do you just say, hey, that was not what, that wasn't right? Or do you lift up your voice a little bit more and you get a little bit more aggravated and you're like, what? Do you want these glasses? What's some... I mean, and some of you grandmas are even doing that. When your, grand, when your grandson's playing or something like that, you're just like, what is going... You just turn into a different person because you are upset with an injustice that's been done, Right? Now, when you hear a lie spoken to you by the enemy, I don't want you just to sit there and go, now that's a lie. I want you to get upset with the enemy. I want you to yell at him and say, that's a lie. Because he is so good at lying to us, we begin to believe that his lies are the truth. So here comes. Let's hear some anger and frustration with the enemy. You're still my slave. Free. You're never going to be free. I see some of you back there, and your lips are not moving. I cannot understand how you can talk without your lips moving. Let's try this one more time. You're still my slave. I'm free. Whoa, you're starting to get it. I remember people, you know, and I, I, I sometimes began with tears running down my eyes, looking at myself in the mirror after having had a failure on a Saturday night, getting up for church on Sunday, and feeling so defeated, and hearing those voice, that voice, you're still my slave, and speaking and saying, I'm no longer a slave. I'm looking at a free man. You're still a slave. I'm looking at a free man. That's not who I am anymore. I'm a free man. With tears running down my face, sometimes for 15 minutes just talking to myself. You know, people say, are you crazy talking to yourself? I want to tell you, David, one time he took his army out. They defeated some people. While he was gone, another enemy came, and they took all his wives, and they took his soldiers' wives, and they took off with them. And the guys that he had gone with, they talked about Stone and David. Do you think that's like a pretty serious business? And when they were talking like that, you know what David did? It said David encouraged himself in the Lord. That means he was talking to himself. He's saying, God is my refuge. God is my strength. God's never let me down before. He talked to himself. And I need you to talk to yourself and tell yourself what God says about you because what God says about you is true. Some people say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I'll tell you something, people. God says it. That settles it. Even if you don't believe it's true, it's still true. So when the enemy tells you you're still his slave, you tell him the truth. I am free. I began to do that, and I began to be about 30% free. Now, some of you are going, well, that's no big deal. Oh, man, when you're 99% bound, 30% freedom is, whoa, it's great. But I still failed quite a bit. I remember one day I was watching television, and I saw this famous preacher had a moral failure. They found him with a prostitute. And I was so defeated, I just said to my wife, I quit. I cannot believe it. If that guy can't live a holy life, nobody can do it. And my wife said to me, why don't you share the fact that you're struggling with my parents? How many of you in this room are not married? Just put your hands up. Let me explain something to you really, really quickly. When you marry someone, the person that you marry, their parents become to you what is called your in-laws. They hate you. <laughs> now, I know there's a couple of you grandmas in here going, I love my son-in-law, and I praise God for all three of you. <laughs> I said to my wife, I would rather eat crushed glass than share my faults with your parents. You know, when you work with your parents and you work with your in-laws, trust me. I mean, you know that, that, that saying, you know, when you feel like saying something you shouldn't say it, you bite your tongue? My tongue used to be about this much longer. <laughs> I got so fed up with failure that one day, I went to my in-laws, 
And I said to them, would you guys please pray for me that God would give me a pure thought life? And this chain, it fell off. And I was so free that I began to dance in church. Now, I'm white and I'm Dutch and it ain't pretty. (laughs) People look at me when I dance and they say, I'm sorry, man, you look like an idiot. (laughs) And I said, I'm not dancing for you. I'm dancing for him because he made me free. And for six months, I walked in incredible victory. And then one day I got into an argument with one of my in-laws. I won't tell you which one it was, but she was right. (laughs) And I could feel this chain around my neck. And I'm declaring I'm a free man. I'm a free man. I just declaring I'm free and nothing worked. And I went and apologized to my mother-in-law. And the chain was gone. And I said, God, I don't understand what is going on here. What happens in the supernatural? What happens in the spirit when I do things in the natural? And so God showed me this. Next slide. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. This is a radical idea. Humility, right? Confessing my faults to another person. Evan, if I tell you my faults, you could tell someone else. See, Jesus is cool. You tell him your faults, he keeps his mouth shut. Right? Unless there's a prophetic person in the room and they start telling everybody what their sins are, but that doesn't happen too often, does it? Right? But when you take the risk and share your faults with somebody else, what happens? Well, it says, confess your faults or your sins to each other. Pray for each other. Why? So that you may be... What's that word? Do you know when we confess our sins to God we can get forgiven. But when we confess our sins to each other, healing can begin to happen. Now, that's taking a risk. That's a radical idea. Have you ever told somebody else what you struggle with? Some of you in this place, you're going, I could never do that. Mm -hmm. Well, would you like to get... See, instead of just getting forgiven every time, wouldn't you love to just get healed of what you're struggling with? Wouldn't that be a lot better? Then you could go through life with victory, right? So what happens when you humble yourself? Next slide. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, God favors or gives extravagant grace to the humble. Now, we've sung songs about the grace of God. Many of us have a clue about the grace of God, but not really a great understanding of God's grace. What is God's grace God's grace is his supernatural enabling that enables us to do what we cannot naturally do ourselves. I had a mind that was so full of garbage. It was full of sinful thoughts, sinful imaginations, sin, just garbage, just completely corroded, just ruined because of what I'd done myself through the choices that I made. But it was broken. I was saved, but my mind was completely guarded. It was just full of junk. But God, by his grace, began to clean my mind out. I couldn't do that. I was incapable of getting my mind clean. But God, by his grace, made my mind clean. That was a process. I had to continually walk in humility. Walking in humility. Walking in humility all the time. Do you know walking in humility is not that much fun? When someone cuts you off in traffic, they have no idea how important you are. You know, you, you want to just lay on the horn, but see, humility is probably the most valuable commodity that Christians have but probably one of the least used. I heard one guy say, you know, well, my wife and I had words the other day and I didn't even get to use mine. (laughs) See, we need to be humble in our relationships with the people around us. I have to be humble to my wife. I have to be humble to my children. 
I have to be humble to people in traffic. I have to be humble when I speak about politics. I have to be humble all the time. None of us has any reason to be proud or arrogant. We all have a great need to be humble because God has forgiven us for an incredible debt. And he's given us his grace that enables us to live different than we used to live. We don't sit there and go, man, you're living wrong. You... It's like, by the grace of God, I'm living right. Oh, God, please help this person to live what's right. You know? And that, there, there's another thing that enters into here sometimes, you know, uh, and I, I, I got to go here for a moment, okay? How many of you, when you were growing up, you saw an adult perhaps a parent, doing something that was so wrong, that was so hurtful, that was so bad that you said, I swear to God, I'll never. How many of you have ever said something like that? Or maybe you didn't even say it out loud, but you thought it. Put, it in. Put your hands up nice and high. Okay. How many of you same people find yourself being very, very similar to that? Okay. Do you want to know why that happens? There's a scripture in the Bible, and this isn't in my message, so I need to share this for somebody here, maybe a couple. The Bible says, whatever you sow, you will reap, right? Now, when you sow, so let's say your daddy or your daddy or your mom hurt you. Maybe they beat you. Maybe they, they said terrible words to you. Maybe they got drunk. They did whatever. Whatever they did, when you say, I swear to God, I'll never be like that, what you're saying is, in my humanity, I am a better person than they are. And do you know what, people? In your humanity, you are no different than them. In fact, you'll be just as bad, if not worse, than them. Because when you say that, you're judging them, and that judgment comes back on you. So what you need to do is, when you recognize yourself doing what your parents or whoever that person was that's hurting you, that hurts you and that you're doing now, you need to say, oh God, I repent for that foolish vow that I made back when I was who knows how big. God, would you forgive me for a foolish vow judging that person who in their humanity was doing what they would do as a human? God, by your grace, help me never to do that anymore. It's by your grace that I walk. It's by your grace that I stand. It's by your grace that I don't walk in sin anymore. It's only by grace that we enter. It's only by grace that we stand. It's only by grace that we walk. It's his grace. Nothing else, people. So we have no right to walk in arrogance. It's his grace that enables us to even walk a little bit straight. And I'm, again, not trying to beat you up, people. I'm trying to help you to see we can be free but we've got to repent of those things that we've done and get understanding that his grace is what enables us to walk in freedom. So some people are, Lloyd, I, I kind of get it, but I still don't really understand it. Let me show you a picture of what God showed me because I, I was trying to understand how does grace work? How does humility work? How does that all fit together? So let me show you a quick picture here. Give me the first video. So this is me without my makeup on. Can you get that thing to, to that video to go? Okay, so God is pouring out his grace, which is symbolized by the water, into my life. I'm a vessel or a container. What stops God's grace from getting into my life? Pride. Pride is like an insidious thing. It's kind of like bad breath. Everyone around you knows you have it, but you don't know you have it yourself. But God's grace cannot get past pride. He pours and pours and pours his grace out on his people. He wants to help them, but his grace cannot get the pride, get past the pride in your life. So you've got to humble yourself. With everything I have in me, I say, humble yourselves, people. Please humble yourselves. Then God's grace can begin to function in your life. So, next slide. One day I went to my in-laws. Next video, please. I went to my in-laws and I said, would you guys please pray for me that God would give me a pure thought life? That took humility, people. I was putting it out there. And when we humble ourselves, we throw that pride away. And then God's grace can not only fill our cups up, it overflows our cups. And we actually become literally immersed in the grace of God. 
Now, how many of you would love to be like that cup, swimming in God's bath of grace, right? How many of you would like to be like that? Well, if you want lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of grace, here's something you can remember. If you want grace, get on your face. The lower you go, the more grace you get. You know, when you humble yourself a little bit, you'll get a little bit of grace. If you want lots and lots of grace, completely humble yourself. I tell you, it's so exciting to get the grace. It's terrifying to humble yourself, but it's worthwhile. I've been living in the grace of God for over 26 years now. It is so good. His grace is so good. It is so liberating. You got to try it. So I'm now about 90% free, but still sometimes stumbling. And I'm like, God, I want to live straight all the time. I don't want to be a 90% Christian. I want to be someone who lives just with integrity all the time. And the Lord showed me, retrace your steps. Every time you fail, it comes from a place. Go and look what you're doing. So I retraced my steps, and every time I failed, it was because of this. Next slide. Some of you may not understand this picture too well, so I'll explain it to you. The, the little box on the left there is called a television, and they seem to have a lot of things that they can pour into my mind that were not helpful. How many of you have ever seen something that you would say, that was garbage on television? Yeah. You see, when you take that stuff in, it affects you. It affects the way you think. It affects the way you act. It affects the way you speak. And I found that, next slide, it's better for you to enter heaven without cable, satellite, internet, or various magazine subscriptions than to go to hell with them. Some of you are going, I did not know that was in the Bible. Well, actually, in the Bible, it says, if your hand offends you, chop it off. If your foot offends you, chop it off. If your eye offends you, gouge it out, right? Now, if we were to take that literally, we would look like Captain Hook. And I don't think that's what God intends for us, but he wants us to, next slide, to extract, and this is the last D, to extract the poison from your life. Philippians 2 verse 12 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, God does an incredible amount of stuff for us, but there is some of it that we have to do. We play a small part in this. We have to agree with us, with, with what God says. So I would sit there, and I would, I, would, I would be going along pretty straight, right? And then I would watch television. I would see something on there. I would have a failure. I'd feel so convicted. I'd feel so defeated. I'd say, oh, God, I'm so, so sorry. Please forgive me. He'd forgive me. And I'd go back and go good for about two weeks. Then I'd sit there, and I'd make up my mind. I'm not going to watch bad stuff on television, right? And then I would sit there and watch something bad again and fail and I kept going through this cycle over and over, and the Holy Spirit kept saying to me, get rid of your TV. But I was like, but I like the sports and the cops and robbers, and I like, you know, the, the news, and I like all that stuff, right? And so I would argue with God. And has any one of you ever won an argument with God? I mean, I'm thinking of Abraham and Lot. I mean, he, he got God down from, like, down to 10 people, but he still lost the argument, you know? And so... One time I was sitting there and I was saying, Lord, I'm so, so sorry. You know what the Lord said to me? Lloyd, you are so, so stupid. I tell you to get rid of your TV, but you don't listen to me. You think you know better than me. Why do you keep asking me what to do? There's some of you in this room, you're wondering why God isn't speaking to you. The possibility is that he has spoken to you, but you haven't done what he said. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just trying to encourage you. Go back to the last time you heard him speak. Maybe there's something that you didn't do that he might be telling you to do. Some of you are going, well, I, I just don't think it's a big deal. How many of you, I want you to do a little experiment, okay? Listen to me. Do what I say, okay? I want you all to take a, your finger and your thumb and make a circle. Okay? Make a circle. Hold it up for me. Show it to me. 
All right, y'all got it? Put the circle on your chin. Be quiet. Okay, now where is your chin? It's right here. Okay. So why? Now, did you not hear my instructions? I told you very clearly. Do what I, I say, right? So I told you, put the circle on your chin, right? But you put your circle over here. You know why you did that? Because you're stupid. <laughs> I shouldn't do that before the offering. That's not a very good idea. <laughs> now listen, people. Listen. The reason you did what I did rather than what I said is because it's your eyes will overrule what your brain knows. Try this again. Close your eyes. Make a circle with your finger and your thumb. Put your circle on your chin. All of you got it right that time. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, not by seeing. Many of you are like, oh, if I see it, I'll believe it. You can be deceived when you, when you watch something. But listen, listen to the word. So I began to recognize I had to get rid of the garbage in my life. I had to get rid of my TV. I got rid of my TV about 25 years ago. Now, I, I don't have it hooked up to cable. I don't have it hooked up to satellite. We do have a television on our bus now, but we just watch DVDs. We'll watch like... Uh, things that are, things that are going to feed our spirit something good rather than going to tear it down. And, you know, again, I'm not telling anyone you got to go home and get rid of your TV. I'm just telling you, you need to listen to what the Holy Spirit tells you when you've got an issue in your life. He will tell you what you need to get rid of. You just need to obey. All right? Next slide. Next slide. Let's read these together. Are you bound... Let's read the words. Pride, lust, gossip, gambling, hatred, envy, bitterness, idols, overspending, overeating, drugs, alcohol, lying, pornography, fear, anger, work, entertainment, anxiety, depression, video games. Only God and you know for sure. Some of you are going, oh, my name, my, my word's not on that list. Hallelujah. You know what? That's not an exhaustive list. That is just a list that has some words on there, but you might, you know, you could, be, you could be hooked on social media. Do you know that there's people who spend six hours a day on Facebook? And it's because they're hooked on the endorphins of the likes. They want acceptance. And there's all kinds of different things that people can be hooked on. Could be texting, could be all kinds of things. I'm not here to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. I'm here to say, if you've got an area in your life where you're bound, Jesus can make you free. He made me free. I was completely bound. He can make you completely free, no matter how, where you're bound. All right? So if you could put your name under one of those words, or maybe your word's not up there, but you know there's a word, I'm bound. You're a candidate for freedom. I came here today, not because I need work. You already know I'm a mechanic. I can fix cars. I came here to help people get free. If you want to be free, that's why we came here today. Can you bow your heads, close your eyes? I got two questions and then I'm done. Question number one, I was headed the wrong direction in my life. I was headed for destruction. I turned away from there and went a different way. How many of you would say, Lloyd, I'm headed the wrong direction in my life. Would you pray with me? I want to go a different direction. Just put up your hands all over this room. How many would say, that's me? Going the wrong direction in life. There's one, there's two, three, four. How many more? Just put up your hands nice and high. Five, six, anyone else? Seven. I'm headed the wrong direction, Lloyd. I, I want to go a different way. There's eight. All right. Well, here's what I want you to do. If, you, if you're going the wrong direction in life and you want to make a change, I want you to pray with me. Just pray quietly. God, your word says that if I confess my sin... You are faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So God, right now, I confess to you, I'm guilty, I've broken your ways, I've broken your laws. Please forgive me. Help me to know that I'm your child. And John 1 verse 12 says, whoever receives you to them, you give power to become the sons of God. So I want to invite you right now, Jesus, into my life by your Holy Spirit. I want you to be the boss or the Lord of my life. And then 
Romans 10, verse 9 and 10 says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I want you to tell someone today, I've committed or I've recommitted my life to following after Jesus Christ. Now, here's my second question. You might say, Lloyd, I'm a Christian, but there's an area of my life where I'm bound. Would you pray for me that God would make me free like you've been free now for so many years? How many in this room would take courage and say, that's me, Lloyd, pray for me? All over this room. There's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. All right, you can put your hands down. I want to ask that question one more time. I don't want you to raise your hand a second time. I just want to ask those who didn't raise their hands, can you be honest with me and be honest with yourself for just a moment? You might say, Lloyd, I would put up my hand, but it weighs so much. That's just a lie. The enemy is saying you can't lift up your hand. What are people going to think? Don't, don't worry about what people think. Worry about getting free. How many of you who didn't raise your hand before you say, Lloyd, I want to be free, pray for me as well? How many more would just join Praise God, there's a couple more. All right. Praise God, you can put your hands down. I want you all to look up at me for a moment. In about 30 seconds, Pastor Lewis is going to come and take an offering for our family. I heard him talk about gas and heard him talk about these things. I don't need you to give to our family because we have a great need. I'd like you to give to our family because what we do has value. If you feel like what we're doing here has value, I'd like you to give. Our budget is probably almost $1,900 a week, so if someone wants to write a check for that amount, that's great. Just make it out to the church. But all of you can do something. I encourage you to give and help us. We believe that this message needs to be spoken in every church, to every people, and we could use your help in doing that. So 